I need you to put your fingers right here and I need you to rub right here. Can you do this? Okay, now keep your fingers here because we're going to pray for real. I want, I want to see participation in this church. Come on. Put your fingers right here. You've never prayed a prayer like this, okay? We're going to pray right now. Here we go. Father, thank you for my amygdala. Thank you. I pray that you would bless them and they would always work in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, um, your amygdala, this is this little cluster of cells right here, right where you touched, and these control fear responses. Okay, so this is the thing inside your body that makes you stop Okay, like when you're walking down the sidewalk and there's a big old dog down the sidewalk, even if you don't like run the other way, your amygdala alerts you, whoa, man, you could be in danger here. You better assess this thing. You will stop involuntarily. You're just like, oh, okay, I need to do something about this. If you're standing like on the side of the road and a big old semi truck's coming down, all right, you will automatically just like, okay, I'm going to step back. You won't think about it. You won't be like, let me think about my size here. I don't know if this is a great idea next to the size. You won't think about it. Your amygdala will take over and you will step back because that is your system that alerts you to potential threat. And this is a really great thing, man. I mean, thank God for that. There's all kinds of situations that we should have that for. We talked last week about, hey, man, if there's really a bear, you're going to want to let go into flight or fright. You're going to want to do something about that. The problem is if you have an overactive amygdala, so in other words, it's responding to things that aren't actually threats. Like you're checking email, but you're freaking out a little bit. Okay, that means you have an overactive amygdala. You guys know what this is like. I have an overactive amygdala in my car. It's that little seatbelt siren that goes off. If you go like 20 feet without like strapping that thing, and it's like, eh, 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 I'm like, shut up. It's overactive. All right, that's my car's amygdala. We have amygdala in my house. They're called my dogs. Okay, so they will lose their minds. If anybody just like knocks the table halfway, they will just go into crazy. They have their over, overactive amygdala for my house. Their, their, their trigger finger is way too sensitive. And all of us have things that trigger us that can send us into stress and anxiety. That's why last week we started talking in this brand new series, Killing Anxiety, we ta started talking about the peace of God. And the peace of God is so important, man. We said last week that the answer to anxiety is not less stress. We think it is, but it's not. It's not less stress. It's more of the peace of God. This comes in super handy with all the pressures that you and I face on a day-to-day -day basis. Everybody suffers from anxiety. In fact, I found out this week 40 million Americans suffer from an anxiety disorder of one kind or another. That's a lot of people. That's 13% of our population. Now, I'm not going to, again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to talk to you much about medical components of anxiety, but what I do want to talk to you about is the spiritual components of anxiety and what to do about those. Because we're going to talk in general about anxiety, not necessarily just folks with anxiety disorders. We're, we're talking about everybody that faces stress, everybody that faces challenges and toughness. And here's what I'm going to submit to you today. The peace of God, we're going to find out, is actually not the result of answered prayers, is the result of praying. Let's think about that for a second. The peace of God is actually, it's not the result of answered prayers. Like you don't get the peace of God once that prayer finally gets answered. And hopefully it does. I hope it does. But that's actually not where the peace of God enters. It enters long before that when we're actually praying. So we're going to talk about how that impacts our anxiety and how we need to um, as a people decide, we're going to bring our worries to God. Because when we do, we're going to experience a couple things. We're gonna, going to experience confidence in God's power. That just means I know somebody who has all power, knows about it, and is on it. But I'm also going to experience the comfort of his presence. This is where the one who has the most power is like cooling me out and making me know that everything is okay. Because the answer to anxiety is not less stress, but more of the peace of God. <clears throat> Here's one other thing that we do when we get stressed. I don't know if you've, you've probably never done this, only people like me, but you ever notice that you're, you're maybe more inclined to make foolish decisions when you're anxious, right? Like this is when road rage happens, isn't it? Right, like you're, you're like, yeah, 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 ah! you know, you just kind of lose it or like you fire off that email, you're like under so much pressure, like I'll tell them what I think. And then instantly you're like, I wonder if I should regret that. 
some of us, you've like sent a voicemail and you broke like five commandments in that one voicemail just because you were under pressure and now you've, you've gone and done something dumb. That's why it's so important for us to take our pressures, take our anxiety, take them to the place where somebody can actually do something about it. And we're going to learn about that again from the Apostle Paul. Remember last week, Paul started to talk to us about his prescription for peace. And we all know Paul would know because he's had all kinds of trouble. He has all kinds of pressures, not to mention like the, the, the beatings and floggings he's been through, but he's currently in a jail cell. He might die. He might be executed. He doesn't know, but he's writing to these Philippians and saying, hey, um, you guys need to have joy and you can embrace God's prescription for peace if you'll just do these things that I'm talking about. So here's what Paul said. Remember, he said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul believes that his God is sovereign. That's why he can say, be anxious for nothing. He believes he's got a sovereign God. We talked last week about this triangle, right? Let's take a look. These are the three things that we need in order to access the peace of God. We got that? Y'all have seen a triangle before, right? You know what that looks like? <laughs> okay, so just imagine. There it is. Um, so down on the lower left, we talked last week about revelation on sovereignty. That just means I get it that God is ridiculously in charge. Today, we're going to talk about prayer and thankfulness and then next weekend, we're going to talk about directed thinking. And we need all three to protect our peace. So again, what is the sovereignty of God? Let's just review real quickly before we move on. The sovereignty of God just means God is ridiculously in charge. In fact, I, I'm losing, when, when I understand and study and, and review God's sovereignty, I actually lose confidence in myself. I'm like, I do not need to run the universe. I'm not very good at that job anyway. There's already somebody on that. They're running it will be just fine. And here's the reality. The degree to which we are meditating and trusting in God's sovereignty is the degree to which we will be anxious for nothing. In, my, in the Carter house recently, um, you might have had this happen in your house, but sometimes you ever just wake up in the middle of the night and like you've got anxiety? Like there's something on your mind. There's something like, oh, I got the thing next week or oh no, I have to talk to that girl and it's not gonna go good and, and I'm afraid of what's gonna, or, or you're like, boom, you just remember this thing that's happening in two weeks and you need to figure out right now what you're gonna do about that. Just anxiety that just strikes. Well, this has been happening to my wife a, a little bit more frequently um, over the past couple months. And it's just real struggle, man. And so I challenged her this past week. I was like, hey, Kenzie, um, here's what I want to challenge you to do. When that happens, just begin to reflect and meditate and just say out of your mouth, my God is sovereign. My God is sovereign. Like my God is ridiculously in charge. He's in charge of everything. Nothing gets past him. He is the supreme ruler and he's got my back and everything is going to go okay. So, I mean, here's a question before we move on. Let's just ask this question. What would your life look like if you really believed that the God of the universe who loves you was really going to work everything together for your good? Like, would that be any different? I think it would for me. And so that's why we got to study it. But here's what we're gonna talk about today. The more I give myself to prayer and thanksgiving, the less anxious I will be. The more I give myself to prayer and thanksgiving, the less anxious I will be. And some of you are like, man, did I come to the prayer message? <laughs> you didn't, you came to the killing anxiety message. That's what you came to. So I hope that's all right. Here's, here's why, again, because God's presence or, or prayer gives me the, the comfort of God's presence and the confidence I need in God's power. It helps me see things completely differently after I've spent a little time in God's presence. You say, Carter, well, why would I have to like pray? Doesn't God already know everything that I need? Doesn't he already know about my anxieties? Didn't Jesus say, your father already knows what you need? So why would I need to pray? Here's why. It's not that God needs to know. We know that he knows. It's that God wants to know that you experientially know that he knows. Let me say that again. God wants to know that you experientially know that he knows. Experiential knowledge is different than this, just this kind of knowledge, right? Okay, so my wife and I, most nights of the week, we do this thing called couch time. 
Okay, that means like we snuggle up after dinner and, and we, just, we just kind of relate, all right? And she tells me about her day. I tell her about my thoughts and, and, and she gets to know like my feelings. And, and some ladies, they really want to know what the dude's feeling and the dudes don't always know what they're feeling. Like, I don't know. But if, if you just get in the habit of couch time, sometimes that comes a little bit more easily. And so we do this thing where we, we sink. That's what happens. We're sinking hearts. So there's not a lot of distance, not a lot of confusion. And after we're done sinking, we now have experiential knowledge that each other knows the stuff. Does that make sense? Because we were to get kind of holding and, and, and now we know that we know. That's different than me sending an email, right? Like I could just turn in my list every night at six. Be like, well, here's all my stuff. I'll see you at bedtime, right? I could do that. That would be information. That would be her knowing, but I don't just need her to know. She needs to know that I know that she knows. I don't even know if that may just made sense, but you hear what I'm screaming, right? We need to experientially know, and, and that's what God is inviting us into. He says, I want you to have the relief of knowing that I'm on it, that I got it, that we've talked about it. Let's, let's, let's consider Peter. We've been talking about Paul a little bit, but let's talk about Peter. Remember Peter? He was one of Jesus's like right-hand disciples, and he was a fisherman. Remember this? But he wasn't like using a rod and reel. That's not how he rolled okay? Um, he had, what did he have? He had a net. And so Peter was used to, like, that's how he would do it, man. He just whoo, cast his net out into the water. Listen to what Peter says to some of his disciples. He says in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him, on Jesus, because he cares for you. Because he cares for you, Peter says, because of his love for you, like, that's, that's where you start. Because of his love for you, here's what I want you to do, people. I want you to take all of your anxieties, like a big net, and I want you to cast it on to Jesus. I want you to let it go. Just boom. There you go, Jesus. Hey, not my problem. Here you go. We're having our couch time, and there are all your problems now, Jesus. They are not my problems because you care for me. And this is what Jesus invites us into. He invites us in. He says, hey, I'll, I'll tell you what. Here's the deal. Why don't you trade me all your worries, and I'll give you my peace? That's the trade that Jesus wants to make. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. This is a scripture that every young new Christian should learn right away. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. In all of your ways, that means in all of your paths, in all of your considerations, in all of your options, not just the urgent stuff, but the things you're thinking about doing. As you come up to a new fork in the road, you say, well, Lord, I'm thinking about taking the job over in that state. I'm thinking about it, but I want to acknowledge all my paths and all of my ways before you. I want you to be able to interact with it and give me your peace about it and show me which one is you. I'm thinking about having that conversation with that girl that I'm kind of intimidated by, but Lord, I just want to present it to you and I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to present you all of my ways and all of my paths and invite you in and thread you in to every component of my life so I can give you my anxiety. Does that sound nice? Because the, the pathway to peace is paved with prayer. I know it's a lot of P words, but it's all still true. That's how this is supposed to work. You say, Carter, what about me? Because I've got, I've got like a lot of anxiety. I'm different than, than most folks. I'm one of that 13%. Like I've got significant anxiety. And so let me say a couple things to you. Hey man, first, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for listening. That's a real thing. Like people have real significant anxiety difficulties that they are working through. So I, I wouldn't want anyone to feel like you're a second-class Christian or something like that. And may, may, maybe those messages have been sent to you. That's just not true. Look, man, medicine is good, okay? Like I took ibuprofen yesterday. Like medicine is good. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of Heavenly Lights. And of course, anyone who's been sick or you've been to a lot of doctors, you know, well, sometimes they don't always get it exactly right. But in general, medicine is a gift from God that we are supposed to use. So I want you to like, some, and I would even say lovingly to some people, you should take your meds a little more. Like, like precious, don't miss it. Please, for our sake, take your meds, okay? Can you do that? But here's two warnings just to be aware of when it comes to this kind of thing. First, just like anything, we wouldn't want to make it a savior, okay? Let's not make our meds, a, just like you shouldn't make a relationship a savior, you shouldn't make a job a savior. There is one savior and his name is Jesus Christ and he will have no rivals and so let's not make anything else a savior. Okay, 
And just, just I, I want to let some people off the hook, just so you know. So during the winter months, I take some medication, real mild, for depression. My doctor gives me, he says, this is the most baby version I can give you, Carter. He gives me this little, this little pill. And, and what it does, it makes me every morning in these long winter months, makes me start on the first floor instead of the basement. I mean, that's just what it's like. I don't feel euphoric or anything like that, but in case there's any kind of stigma there, just know the pastor takes a little bit of depression medicine in the winter months, and it super helps, okay? Just like the ibuprofen did. Um, so I just want you to know that, but I wouldn't want to make it a savior because it's just a tool. It's just a blessing from God. It's a blessing. It's not a savior. Here's number two, though, and this one I, I, I've heard a lot from people. Some folks, I don't know why, it's, it's, just, it's just us, they put themselves in a special category because they have anxiety. Okay, in other words, they'll say to me, listen, Carter, and they say just like this. Not really. This is, my, this is my dramatization of what they say. Listen, Carter, don't you tell me to pray and give thanks because I have anxiety issues. And let me tell you why that's a little um, silly to say. I have high cholesterol. This is real. I go to my doctor, and my doctor says, hey, listen, you have a genetic predisposition to having high cholesterol. Here's what you should do. You should do two things. First, you should do the thing everybody should do. You should eat less red meat, and you should work on your cardio. You should go running. You should do things that are going to make you have to do a lot of heavy breathing. Everybody should do that. And you should take this Lipitor that will help your cholesterol. Now, if I were to just lose my mind right at that moment and say, Doc, don't you tell me <laughs> to go running and eat less meat because I have a cholesterol issue. That's the issue. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, this will help everybody. And in your case, let's give you a little bit of extra help as well. What are we saying? Hey, man, meds should not be... Um, a replacement for thanksgiving and prayer. They should be a companion for thanksgiving and prayer. Are we, are we hearing this? So if medication can help me, um, you know, think a little bit clearer, calm down a little bit, and it helps me, okay, now I'm gonna go do the thing that everybody should do to uh, meet anxiety, which is thanksgiving and prayer. That would be like a really good idea. Here's, here's one more caution. Let's not grow numb. If, if medication is something that you take, man, great, don't grow numb to your need. Just because you've calmed down now, don't grow numb to your need for thanksgiving and prayer because, check it out, no medicine in the universe will give you the peace of God. You can't get that in a pill, all right? You can calm down, oh yeah, but you can't get the peace of God. That comes from one place. That comes from the presence of God. How many think this is a pretty good message so far? Well, it's God's word. Of course, it's good. Hey, um, <laughs> listen to what Ed Welch said. He, he wrote this in Running Scared, Worry Free, and the Rest of God, and the God of Rest. He says, worry's dangerous. It's not to be trifled with. When you find worries, anxieties, and fears, pay attention. Worry and fear are more about us than about the things outside of us. They reveal what is valuable to us, and what is valuable to us, in turn, reveals our kingdom allegiances. One way to think about it is worry is the smoke. Don't be satisfied with just waving away the smoke. Find the fire. And the fire is the anxiety in our hearts. And you find that through prayer. God, what is like going on in my heart that I need you to say, I am sovereign over this, over? How's that supposed to work? You know, Jesus himself commanded this and modeled it. You remember what Jesus did in the garden of Gethsemane the night before he died? What was he found doing? Now, he was, he was not sinning, but he was definitely under tremendous pressure. He was definitely under tremendous anxiety. He was, the Bible says he was sweating dr great drops of blood. So deep was his anguish. So he knows what this is like. And what is he found doing? Praying. That's, that's what the Son of God is found doing. And so he's our perfect model. And this is what he says to you and I. He says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, not for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they are? Now, he's talking about like food. It's not even like, am I gonna get the next iPhone? He's talking about, are you going to eat today? Don't sweat it. 
talk to your daddy about it because he's got your back. <clears throat> Here's, we're gonna come down to it here. More prayer is going to equal less anxiety. Some of us are gonna resist that. And so I just want to gently say it again because it's actually true. More prayer is going to equal less anxiety. To say it a different way, if you and I prayed more, we would have less anxiety. Yes, we would. That is the truth. Look, I'm a preacher of God's word. I'm telling you, that's what's true. Let's do a little test. <clears throat> Look back over your past month and we're gonna, you're gonna score yourself. You're gonna score yourself on your amount of anxiety between one and 10. Like how was your anxiety in the past month? 10 means like, dude, you were shaken and you could like barely not scream. Okay, that's, that's the level of anxiety a 10 is. What's your score? You don't have to say it out loud, but just, just pick, you know, figure it out in your head. Okay, now look back over the past month. What is your score in prayer? It's probably the inverse. Okay, what that means is, hey, if you got like a four in anxiety, you probably had a pretty good, a pretty good prayer life, man. You probably had at least a six. That was good. If you had like an eight in anxiety, your prayer was probably two. What are we saying? Hey, if you really want less anxiety, you're gonna have to pray. Oh God, do you have another version? <laughs> I don't, but can I just lovingly as, as your pastor, <clears throat> this is the Bible. This is Christianity. This is what we do. Hey, I, I don't understand a generation that wants some other version of Christianity than the one that is here. This is, no, no, there's not a ton else you can do other than pray. That's what the saints of old did. That's what you and I are supposed to do. That's what is prescriptive in God's word. That's what we do, man. And if we would pray more, we would have less anxiety. And I don't mean like, like bless the Big Mac prayers. That's not what I'm talking about. And those are fine, okay, right? This is a little, Lord, make this have less calories. Like you can, yeah, do that. Those are good prayers. But that's not the kind of prayer we're talking about. We're talking about the, hey, I am getting on my knees. I've got a list, okay? I'm spending some time. Like if you came to my house, you'd, you might even find me from time to time. Like, oh, I interrupted. Someone's just sitting there praying. Like that might happen. And you're fervent and you're saying, God, I'm inviting you. I'm casting the net. And, and as you're there for five or 10 minutes, you're gonna start to feel the peace of God begin to flood your soul. Dude, it's just going to happen. You say, Carl, are you talking legalism? You just giving me a law to do? Nope. I'm telling you how to get rid of anxiety. That's how you do it. You don't have, you don't have hey, you can have all the anxiety you want if you want it. I'm just saying, if you, want to, if you want to spray for ants, you know what I'm talking about from last week? If you want to spray the raid, you're going to have to pray it away. That's how it goes, especially if you've got like some kind of big deal going on lately. Or you've, you know, you've got a lot of anxiety. It's going to require much prayer. Little prayer, little peace. A lot of prayer, hey, a lot of peace. That's great, but that's how it's going to be and you won't find, well, my personality is just a little bit different. It might be a little bit different, but I, I would challenge you, it's not as different as you think it is. You're not in a special category. More prayer will equal more peace. Yes, it will. That's how it works. So I'm gonna be less anxious if I pray and I'm gonna be less anxious if I give thanks. <laughs> I'm gonna be less anxious if I give thanks. We don't, we don't know this, but failure to give thanks is one of the things that God sees as, here's one of the things that's actually wrong with people. This is an effect of the fall. The fall, remember, that's the disease of sin that is inside all of us because not only our first parents, but us, we have committed treason against our maker. We've said, no, I'm gonna do it my own way. I'll be my own God, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll do things the way I want to. And God says, one of the results is, not only do you not worship me, but you don't give me thanks. Listen to the way Paul describes it in Romans 1, talking about humans in general. <laughs> he says, Yes, they knew God, meaning they saw God's creation. They saw the ways that his own creation was testifying to his reality, but they wouldn't worship him as God. They, they wanted to worship other things, you know, self and agendas and, and creatures and, and all kinds of stuff. They wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And the Lord points it out. They didn't even thank me. Even though I give them every day, like they have organs that are working that they don't even know are working, that I'm causing to work for them. 
I give them air and I give them rain and I cause them to be able to think creative thoughts. I've stamped my image into them. I've done all this stuff for them. I've surrounded them with great people, great opportunities, put them in the uh, most amazing nation in the history of the world and they don't thank me for it. God wants us, and he, he points out to us, he says, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. He wants us to give him thanks. And here, here's what we're gonna find. <clears throat> if you only ask for stuff, you're at, you can actually gain anxiety. Because all you're seeing is, well, here's what I don't have. God, here's again what I don't have. God, here's again what I don't have. Thanksgiving widens our perspective, doesn't it? Thanksgiving tells us, actually, um, you have a lot going on that's really good. <laughs> like your life is pretty great. Yes, there are hard stuff, hard things, but there's a whole lot that is going on great for you. And as we acknowledge God's goodness to us, he decides, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually bless you even more because you're thanking me. I'll give you an example of my house. My kids are awesome. Our family's pretty tight. But I would tell you, you know, as, as any dad would, sometimes the kids get to complain it, Okay. Like they, there's something, eh, I don't have this thing, or I wish we could do this. And, meh, 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 meh. And, I, and here's what I know as a dad. I'm like, kid, your life is pretty awesome. Like I can see it, it's awesome. You don't even know how awesome your life is because you don't know about any other lives. Like your life is awesome. And as they're complaining, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying to actually reinforce, no, I might even take some stuff away just so you get humbled and you get just how awesome your life is, right? <laughs> Some parents are amen to me a little louder now. <laughs> but you know what's weird? Is when I've got a really appreciative kid, like when, when, when one of them is just like, oh, thank you, know, thank you, Dad, for this, and thank you, Mom, for that. And Man, we're just so surrounded by abundance, and, and what a great life. I mean, they don't even get like five sentences into it. I'm like, man, I got some money around. Let's get some ice cream, you know? <laughs> I, I'm looking for ways. This is an appreciative kid. I'm going to get him something, you know? just because they're testifying about how good they're, oh, you want good? I'll give you good. Here you go. And I'm not saying that God is like me, but I'm just saying, dude, appreciation goes a long way. And it flips our script. It makes us understand God's actually been really redonkulously good to us. And we need to factor that in when we're asking him for stuff. So it, it can, it can, it can release God to do more. And it also releases me from we're getting there, we're getting there. It releases me from the anxiety of guilt. So I, I, I just did a little minor studying this week, but I, but I found that one study found that we spend up to five hours per week feeling guilty. Did you know this? Like feeling guilty, maybe about some stuff that we've done, maybe about some stuff that we have that we see other people don't have. Um, maybe that it's going so right for us and we don't feel like we deserve for it to be going so right for us. But according to this study, we spend about five hours a week feeling guilty. Now, I, I don't want to set off any alarms. Feeling guilty is not, it's not only because of sin, but sin can be the cause of anxiety. It's not the only cause, but it would be foolish to not consider it as a cause. Why? Because the Bible says it's a cause. Okay, God has already told us this can cause you anxiety. And I want to read it to you because God's going to illuminate us here. It's in Psalm 32. I want to show you so that you can say, no, it's actually in God's word. But I want to start in verse three because I want you to see how difficult it is for the psalmist to get through this. Verse three says, when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Man, that sounds hard, doesn't it? Anybody know what it's like to be under conviction? Just under like, oh, Verse four, day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. Like God's putting a little bit of pressure on to get him to do what? To confess and ask for forgiveness. That's what he's trying to do. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I'll confess my rebellion to the Lord. Oh, how, how brilliant that is. That's the only place you can bring that. And you forgave me all my guilt is gone. You think God wants to lift the burden of guilt off of us? Of course he does. And so he'll allow us to get a little bit of anxiety. So, so we just ask the question, wait a minute, what is going on here? God, is there something between us? If I, if I done something to maybe hurt your spirit, uh, let me know so that I can ask for forgiveness for it. And as soon as we do, listen to what he says in verse one and two, because if you're a Christ follower, you need to receive this is for you. This is you. 
This is you 24-7, but this is how God wants you to think about yourself with regard to your sin. Check it out. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. And you were honest with God about your sin, and he says, just so you know, because of Jesus Christ, this is the gospel right here. You can bring all the anxiety that you're feeling about guilt. You never have to hide it. You never have to feel bad about it. Just bring it to Jesus. That's where it belongs. And he says, by the way, I have cleared your record entirely of guilt. I already paid for that on the cross. I just wanted you to agree with me that that thing was evil. And now you can receive the fullness, the weight of my forgiveness. And you don't have to carry the anxiety of sin. Jesus carried it all the way up to the cross and it was cursed and defeated right there. Oh, come on, somebody. We're almost there. I know I got eight seconds, but I'm going to take a little longer. Um, here we go. So what do we do? So um, we're praying. We're giving thanks. But we're praying specifically. That's what we need to make sure we do. That's the way Jesus challenged us to do it. Let me tell you about Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus. This is what uh, we're told in Mark chapter 10, verse 47. When Bartimaeus, okay, so this blind dude, heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's what I love about him right here. He's getting loud about it. He's like, I need Jesus. I need to bring my request to Jesus. There's the right place. I'll bring it to him. Verse 48, people around him, be quiet. Many people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. Sometimes just when you start praying for real, like you'll get all these voices, shut up. Hey, God's not gonna do nothing. You sit down. You might as well just say nothing. Hey, just, just try to solve it yourself. As soon as you start crying out, son of David, have mercy on me. Hey, you be quiet. That's what the enemy of your soul will try to get you to do. Verse 49, when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So he called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, came to Jesus. I love his zeal, man. He's running straight for Jesus. I know who will help me. Jesus will. Verse 41. Listen to what Jesus asked him. What do you want me to do for you? Isn't that a strange question? If I was standing there, I'd be like, um, Jesus, I think it's the blind thing. Like... <laughs> Do you see the way he stumbled over here? Like, I think, I'm guessing it's the blind thing. Of course, Jesus knew he was blind. And yet Jesus wanted to know, no, specifically, what do you want me to do? Jesus wants us to get concrete. It says, Rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. He approaches with specificity and faith. My friends, sometimes I wonder if we just pray too vaguely. Think that's possible? Like we're just, oh God, bless it. And God's like, what exactly do you want me to do? Lord, help them. What exactly do you want me to do? Because I want you to give me the praise and the glory afterward. I want you to be able to tell I did it. So what is it? What precisely would relieve the anxiety? Like what do you want God specifically to do? In Bill Fry's book, Dance of Hope, he tells the story of this young teenager who he would try to get stumps out of the yard for his dad. You know, he's, he's trying to like pull these stumps out and this one, while dad was at work, he, he worked for like four hours trying to get this stump out of the ground, you know, just, just, you know, losing it, getting exasperated. And then dad finally comes home. He's like, son, did you use all your strength? And the kid freaks out a little bit. Dad, ugh, come on, I've been doing this for, for like four hours. And the dad says, you used all your strength, but you didn't use all the strength you had access to because you have access to my strength. So let's do it together. My friends, is it possible that we're trying to do a whole lot of stuff in our strength, remove anxieties in our strength, and God is saying, what do you want me to do? Be concrete, come to me with faith, and it might take us a little while, but we're gonna take the roots out of the ground. For some of us, you've had some issues in there for a long time, and so the Lord's not gonna deliver you just like that. It's gonna take some time to work that stuff out, but maybe you need to come to him and say, Lord, we're not gonna make tuition. Like there's a hole in our bucket, okay, and we're not gonna make it. I need you to come through with some kind of financial help. Or we might say, um, Lord, I, need my, I, I can feel my heart being hardened to that person, to that people group, and I need you to soften it. Lord, I've gotta have that conversation 
you know, with my coworker later on, and I'm pretty sure he's hiding something from me, and I'm asking you to expose it. What is it you want God to do for you? What is the mountain that you wish he would get on right away? Maybe it's just, um, I want a promotion. Maybe you just need to, what is the specific promotion you want? Maybe you need to say, Lord, I, I straight up just need new jeans. Like, that's what it is. Like, you can, you can tell him that. Be concrete, full of faith. Jesus, this is what I want. And it might be that he makes you wait a little while. It might be that he just gives you the wisdom to go solve it. It might be that he just introduces you to the person that's a divine connection that can help you take it to the next level. We don't know what he's gonna do, but he definitely wants us to be specific. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna remember that the peace of God is not the result of prayers answered. It's the result of praying. And what I wanna do right now as a church, is a little different. We're actually gonna pray right now. We're gonna pray right here in this auditorium. And what I want you to do is, some of you, like this freaks you out, like you just, your anxiety level just went way up. Oh, guess what? You should pray, that'll help, okay? But, but we're gonna to turn to one another. And if you don't know how to pray out loud or that's weird for you, don't worry about it. Just someone else in your group will take the lead and they'll pray. But if you see somebody who's alone, I know my church is friendly enough to make sure we nobody's alone. You're gonna suck somebody into your group. And we're just gonna pray for three minutes and here's what I want you to pray. You're gonna thank God for something specific. Say, like, praise God for this. And you're gonna ask for something specific. Maybe only in your heart. Maybe somebody in your group's gonna do it out loud. Pick just, man, three or four and just do it. We're gonna pray for three minutes because we should do the lab of the thing we just studied. And then I'm gonna close this in prayer. Are you ready for less anxiety? Let's pray. Grab somebody, suck people in. Just start praying, start thinking. seconds. Everybody praying with me. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy toward us. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you that you are determined to teach us to bring our anxieties to you, to cast all of our anxieties on you, to receive your mercy for all of our sin. God, thank you that it's because of your love that we can bring it all to you. Lord, I pray for a spirit of peace to descend upon our people for the rest of this day and as we learn to pray more and more in Jesus' name.